So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Tis the season for year-end interviews with Capitol leaders. Assembly Speaker Robin Voss represents the 63rd District. He's, uh, I think, finishing seventh year as Speaker. Do I have that right? Time goes fast, Steve. Seventh year. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, think, have we done this for all seven years? Uh, well, we should have. Probably. If I we think, didn't. Right, yeah. <laughs> what kind of a year did Assembly Republicans have, Mr. Speaker? You know, it was really a good year. As I think back uh, a year ago now, most people were trying to figure out how the Capitol would work. Uh, would they have a budget that went until the snow flew? Would they be able to find consensus? Would it all be arguing? And yeah, we've had our fair share of disagreements, no doubt about that. With divided government, that's going to happen. Um, but I would also say I'm super proud of the fact that we were able to negotiate a budget between the Senate and the Assembly. Um, you know, unfortunately, very little involvement from Governor Evers or the Democrats because they all voted no. But in the end, Governor Evers deserved credit that he signed a conservative budget. Um, you know, some of the things he did with his vetoes I wasn't a big fan of, but that's his right under the Constitution. So we had a budget that was signed into law um, by the 4th of July that increased funding for schools, cut, prop or cut income taxes for the middle class, all at the same time while making sure we didn't expand welfare or grow the size of government beyond our means to pay. So I think it was a big victory. We had summer off, we came back in the fall, and then we focused on our speaker's task forces, which are something that I am really proud of. Uh, the nice thing is that in the Capitol, there is nobody in Madison who is pro-suicide or anti-clean water mm -hmm. or doesn't want more adoptions, right? That's hopefully topics that we chose that could allow Democrats and Republicans to come together to, yeah, have disagreements on policy, but in the end rally around things that we know are good for the state. So I'm proud of the year that we had in 2019. You know, we still have more work to do in the spring of 2020 before we finish in February, uh, but I think we've had a really good start. B biggest disappointment in 2019, Mr. Speaker? Um, you know, I'm actually a pretty optimistic person in general, so I look and say that um, we did a lot of good things. I would have probably loved for some of the pro-life bills that we passed early in the year to actually become law. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of allowing someone to kill a child after they're born still to me is absolutely abhorrent. Uh, Governor Evers vetoed those. I wish we could have found a way to get him to yes on that. Um, you know, there are other things where I look and see bills that have been vetoed that were passed with unanimous votes and there's really no idea why Governor Evers vetoed them because he's had to go back and do something I think which is basically unprecedented to correct his own veto message because they had the bill wrong. Uh, you know, so I think it's a learning curve for Governor Evers and his staff and you know, I understand that, but some things that were really unprecedented that, you know, that are unfortunate, but you know, that's the way it goes. Democratic leader Hintz sat in that chair yesterday and said that um, Governor-elect Evers got a 12-hour honeymoon because of the lame duck laws. That's the point one from uh, Mr. Hintz. Point two, Lame duck laws pointed, uh, poisoned excuse me, the environment for this year. I want to give you a chance to respond. You know, I guess maybe once again it's my optimistic nature, but I choose to focus on the future, not the past. I could spend a whole lot of time sitting around every day regretting the fact that Governor Evers got elected, right? I think Governor Walker should be in the governor's office now, but I don't let that dictate how I operate. You know, we still want Governor Evers to succeed. I want him to sign the bills that we pass. You know, I'm not going to focus on that. I also am proud of the fact that for the first time in generations, the legislature took back power that naturally flows to the executive. You know, it's ironic because had Governor Walker won re-election, as I've told you before, and Governor Walker has said himself, we had already had discussions about turning some of these powers back to the legislature because they were incorrectly given to the executive branch over the past several decades. So if Governor Walker was still in there, Hintz would have criticized me saying they weren't enough. So you can't base it on who the person is, you have to base it on the institution. I think the fact that a governor shouldn't be able to spend money without the legislature authorizing it, that's like Schoolhouse Rock 101. Uh, I think that the governor shouldn't be able to do certain things that were allowed to him under both Governor Thompson, Governor Doyle, Governor Walker. We got those back for the legislature. He should be cheering the fact that it happened, not lamenting the fact that it did. How, could, how can you and Senate, uh, Senator Fitzgerald and the governor work better next next year? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, and I'm always open. I think the first thing that disappointed me was the basic idea of communication, okay? For all the disagreements that Senator Fitzgerald, the governor, and I had over the course of the past eight years, every week, by and large, you know, most weeks, we sat down and met. Governor Walker's 
policy was every Wednesday, any legislator, Democrat, Republican, Senator, Assembly member could make an appointment and talk to him about any topic they thought was important. And then during the course of those meetings, we would also have our time for the three of us to sit down with our chiefs of staff and kind of say, okay, what are we working on? Where can the agenda move? Mm -hmm. I asked for that in my first meeting with Governor Evers and he basically said no that he wanted to do it on an as-needed basis. And of course, I respect that, he has every right to. Mm -hmm. But if you don't sit down and have regular communication on a very often basis, you're not gonna establish the rapport and the relationship to get stuff done. You know, I'm involved in NCSL and the National Speakers Group. That is kind of the norm of legislators and governors across the country. So that would be one thing that I would say, I don't know why we got off on the foot of not meeting every week, kind of at a set time so we could all plan around it. That'd be something that could be different. That was a regret. I think we, I could have pushed harder for that, okay. that I'll take my own responsibility, that I should have insisted that we meet every week to have that open communication and the open dialogue. And you'd but still like that to happen I, in 2020? I mean, yeah, I would love for it, but I've kind of given up because I asked for it so often last spring. I'm not going to beg, okay. uh, but it's where we are. What are your top three priorities for the spring session? Do you want... X, Y, and Z passed before lawmakers go home. So. Yep, so we'll adjourn at the end of February. Uh, that's kind of our normal schedule, as you recall. So um, first, I'd like to get our speaker task force bills through the assembly and hopefully the Governor Evers' desk. Uh, that's focusing on clean water, which will be announced in January. Mm -hmm. That's we just announced our final package and passed through committee all of our bills on increasing adoptions. Those will be adopted in January on the floor. And then we've got the suicide prevention bills that went through the assembly in November and hopefully will be acted on in by the Senate in the spring. So those would be three top priorities. We have some new things we're going to come out with as well. Um, you know, you look at what's happening, especially around the area of crime. Uh, I have got a sincere concern that we are seeing increased rates of crime, especially property crimes in the suburbs around Milwaukee. Uh, so I'd like to at least look at that to say, are we doing an adequate job making sure people aren't plea bargaining down or, you know, it's too easy to never arrest somebody who's a repeat offender. Uh, we passed several drunk driving bills. I would love to make sure that those get to Governor Evers' desk because I think all of us, again, can agree on cracking down on repeat drunk drivers. So I feel like there's a lot of topics that, again, don't fall into that natural partisan, uh, you know, divide that we should be able to find consensus. What's the problem with funding the homeless package? that the governor wrote you and uh, uh, Mr. Fit, uh, Senator Fitzgerald about this week. So what's it's in the, the budget. What's, a, what's the Senate problem? Uh, you'd have to ask the Senate. Uh, it's in the budget. We already adopted it in the Assembly. So that's, 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 not our, that's not our area of concern. Okay. Let's look forward to the November 2020 elections. You'd like to pick up three seats to have a veto-proof majority. How, real, nice. how, how, how realistic is that? Uh, I think it's possible. Um, I look at it this way, that you know we have almost always outperformed what the talking heads say we're going to do, right? Because remember, oh, Governor Walker's going to lose in 2011. He's got this re-election uh, that's never going to happen with the recall. You're going to lose seats in the assembly. We gain seats. Um, you know, last time around, oh my goodness, it's the midterm election with Donald Trump. You're going to almost lose the majority, and we only lost one seat, and by 131 votes. So I am very optimistic that with President Trump on the ballot, where our base is energized, there really aren't never Trumpers anymore. I think you even see his polls rising with this mistaken impeachment. Uh, you look and we say we have the seat that we can get back fairly easily, I hope, um, that Robin Vining temporarily holds. Uh, we have the seat outside of La Crosse that was former Speaker Hipsch's seat with Steve Doyle. And then we have two seats in northern Wisconsin uh, where we know that President Trump continues to get more popular as every year goes on, that I think we also have a chance with some really good candidates that are going to come out. So I think it's possible. I, would say it's an, I wouldn't say it's likely, but I certainly think that we have continued to under-promise and over-deliver, and this is an option for us to do that. Well, Speaker Hintz said, look, I'm going to add... Not Speaker. Add uh, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Yeah. <laughs> Assembly Democratic Leader yeah. said he's going to ha advise his candidates to run on expanding MA, uh, medical marijuana, the failure to pass gun safety laws. Are those liability issues? And again, I... Assembly Democratic leader hints. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> um, well, during the WMC discussion last fall, uh, the Democrat leader in the Assembly basically guaranteed they can't get a majority. So I'll take Gordon at his own words that they can't get a majority because we're doing a great job. No, he didn't say that, but that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that on those topics, I'm in favor of medical marijuana, as are many of our caucus colleagues, but not everyone. 
So I certainly think that's going to take time to percolate and work its way through the process. Senator Fitzgerald has already ruled it out, so it's not going to happen. But that felskowski bernier bill comes pretty close to your criteria. Um, you know, parts it of it pretty, do. Yeah. I, I think there are way too many dispensaries. Uh, I would not have over 100, which is what it's looking at. I have concerns to make it a for-profit motive, which is really what they would do in their bill. But yeah, I think it's a good first effort. Should he, should he get think. a public hearing in, 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 in your house? Um, we'll talk about it. We have not caucus on that topic. But I, I also don't like to have public hearings on topics that aren't actually going to become law. Right? I don't want to just turn it into a partisan match where we already see that Gordon Hintz is trying to use medical marijuana as a wedge to drive us apart, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, hey, this is great. Republicans and Democrats agree on medical marijuana. So having a hearing probably makes it even more partisan, which won't necessarily help to get the bill to become law. Um, on the other topics, expanding welfare, yeah, I'm happy to run on that. They want to expand welfare. We want to maintain the healthy, robust private sector health insurance we already have. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. And as far as the other topics, they all voted against increasing funding for education, increasing funding for hospital payments, you know, a middle income tax cut. They don't have any record to run on besides criticism of us. And the one thing that I have learned is you don't become a majority by criticizing the other side. You have to actually offer your own ideas that somebody in rural Wisconsin or in a suburban seat or, or a central city wants to vote for, not just wants to vote against. The bill that would ban sanctuary cities, do you want that to get a, the, a vote in both houses and, and uh, pass the, the well, session? Remember two years ago, I don't remember the exact session, but we've already adopted that in the past. It died in the state senate. So this time around, I know the state senate had a hearing. Let's see if it gets out of the state senate, and if they are able to get it to the floor and pass it, then we'll take a look and see if it's a version that we could adopt. But you know, I'm not going to constantly play this role where we pass a bill and it dies in the state senate. Um, you know, I want to make sure we actually have the ability to get something to become law. Uh, you alluded earlier to the. Um impeachment proceedings in Washington. If it plays out the way it's supposed to, I mean, the House already voted articles of impeachment, the Senate trial at some point uh, will not, uh, will uh, quit the president. Will that hurt Assembly Republican candidates in November of 2020? No, I, I think we're already seeing that people, just like they did during the recall, where the Democrats were in such a fervor to say that they hated Act, Act 10 and that they hated Governor Walker, they were going to recall him and show us. Well, the people of Wisconsin said, look, this is not the way that we should be doing things. We don't want a recall. And he got more votes than he did in the election. I think that's what's going to happen with President Trump, that the Democrats should have been patient and said, look, we disagree with him on the policy, but we're not going to take the day after the election and try to figure out a way to impeach him, which is what some Democrats were already suggesting right after the election, right? This guy's illegitimate. He's not going to serve his four years. So, look, I did not want Governor Evers to win. But he's the governor, and I hope for four years. I hope he's healthy. I hope he's able to maintain his office. I hope he does everything to be able to serve out his full term. Hopefully not another one, um, but to serve out his full term, because that's what we have elections for. And I would say to my Democratic colleagues, you are driving people toward helping Donald Trump, which serves my own political benefit, but I think it's bad for the country. We should not have partisan impeachment hearings that try to show that this election was illegitimate. Donald Trump is the president, and he has every right to serve four years and show for the country what he can do and then be judged on the consequences of his decisions, just like Governor Evers. Four years to do his job, then we'll judge him on whether or not he did a good job and deserves re-election if he chooses to run. So I just think it's bad for our country. I frankly do, and I would say that no matter what. We didn't try to impeach Barack Obama. Right? And there were a lot of people who thought he did things wrong. But he had the right to serve, and he served all eight years, and now we have the chance to judge him historically. And impeachment's going to motivate your base voters? Mr. Oh, I Speaker? definitely think so. And don't okay. forget, there were all those never-Trumpers who were in southeastern Wisconsin. Almost all of them have returned to the Republican fold. So I am very optimistic about our chances. I mean, you look at the polling, even now, with all the negativity that the media is portraying around Donald Trump, the, t the polls in Wisconsin basically have him leading or tied. So that's a pretty good sign for us. The, um, how important uh, potential impact of this lawsuit now at the federal level and the state level over the 234,000 movers, uh, people who are no, may, no, may no longer be at the addresses that are on the uh, state voter registration roll? Uh, p p uh, potential impact? Should the Elections Commission remove those, sir? Well, it's much ado about nothing. I mean, don't forget, we put a system into place called ERIC. Uh, it is a national system that kind of checks addresses and to make sure nobody's voting twice. It passed on a bipartisan basis. Everyone universally said this is a great way for us, to, for the Democrats to show there's no fraud, and for Republicans to say, if there is any, here's how we find it. 
Well, Wisconsin has same day registration. So if for some reason you are taken off the rolls because you've moved, you show them your driver's license and you can vote in about two minutes. So this idea that we're taking off 200,000 voters, if you've moved, you are not legitimately able to vote in that old address. You've got to register new where you're living. So you vote for the correct member of the assembly, the correct member of Congress. So I feel like this is another example where Democrats are taking something that was bipartisan and kind of assigning some kind of a partisan tinge to it when the reality is we already have a system that's fairly simple and we want to prevent fraud. That's what we both agreed to. And that's why the law is as clear as it is. And the judge did the right thing in Ozaki. And now we have Democrats trying to, I think, use this as a national issue to say, oh, we're disenfranchising voters, when the reality is it was bipartisan before and it certainly should be today. The giant Foxconn complex being built is in your district. Yeah. One year from now, will they be manufacturing what and uh, what are you hearing in terms of how many jobs will be in, uh, uh, on that campus? Well, we already know they're going to meet the job goals for this year. Remember, it was a ratcheted up. It was a couple hundred last year, over 500 this year, more next year, and they kind of work their way up as they grow. Uh, they've already announced they're going to meet the job goals for this year, so they're continuing to grow, which is what we want. Um, you know, this week, uh, Governor Walker, I'm sorry, Governor Evers continued what Governor Walker started with Milwaukee Tool. Uh, congratulations to Governor Evers for, I think it's 850 Eight, jobs. 870 and, jobs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's great. Um, but I didn't see in any single report if we were asking whether or not they make cordless screwdrivers or cordless drills, right? Because it doesn't matter. I don't care what they make inside the building as long as they build the building and they employ the people at the wages they promise. Well, why should we have a different criteria for Foxconn? I don't care if they make Gen 10 or Gen 6 or Gen 22 as long as they employ the people they promised and they put the money into the buildings that they guaranteed they would to be able to pay off the bonds. So I think this is much ado about nothing again, and I don't want it to become partisan. So I'm going to take Governor Evers at his word. He said he supports Foxconn. He wants him to succeed. I don't think they're trying to look for a loophole to cancel the contract, and I hope that they won't. Well, uh, just two final questions. One of them is a follow-up on Foxconn. When uh, Secretary of Administration Brennan sends a letter saying you're not going to get tax credits unless the original 27 deal is renegotiated it, and then a Foxconn representative said this is a red herring who's right well the red herring would be there's no need to renegotiate the deal if it's just a gen 6 versus a gen 10 that's a clerical correction that can be made by WEDC in the contract to say again we don't care what you make because it's not our job to tell Kohler if they should make toilets or faucets, right? It's not our job to tell anybody what company they should, what uh, product they should make inside their facility. We want you to employ people and build things that pay taxes. So if it's just a simple correction as to Gen 10 or Gen 6, that could be done like that. But if it's trying to renegotiate the entire deal and change the tax credits and try to have them get less of an incentive, well, that undermines the entire promise that was made by the state of Wisconsin, and I can see why Foxconn would be concerned. Do you see that's the intent of the Evers administration? I have not talked to them about it. They haven't talked to me. Okay. So I'm going to take them at their word that it's just, a, you know, it's much ado about nothing. It should be simple. It should allow us to say, look, let's clarify and be accurate, but let's not try to find a loophole to cancel the contract, which would be devastating for Racine County and, frankly, the whole state of Wisconsin. And then the final question, when pundits list potential Republican candidates for governor in 2022? Should your name be on it? Nope. Nope. <laughs> a very succinct ending. Easy enough. <laughs> Easy enough. That's right. I, I love being speaker. I look forward to working with the next Republican governor, who I hope will be in 2022. I hope to be speaker after that, so I hope to be able to spend some time with them. So I love being speaker. I love the legislature. That's the one thing, you know, somebody asked me today, um, you know, what have you learned most since you became the speaker seven years ago? Because at the end of this term, I'll be the longest serving speaker in our state's history. Mm -hmm. And it's that I love the legislature and that I found my niche. I don't want to, I had the chance to run for Congress. I didn't want to do that. You know, I could run for governor. I don't want to do that. I want to have the strongest, most representative, best working legislature in the entire country. Uh, and that's what I hope to accomplish. Speaker Robin Voss represents the 63rd Assembly District. Thanks for your time and happy holidays. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. Wisconsin Eye would not exist without generous donors like you. Please visit wisai.org to make a donation today. <laughs>